Okay, everybody, um, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today for this information session on uh, the main DOE's funding opportunity for the BAR, uh, for implementing BAR in your schools. Um, as you just were alerted, we're gonna record this meeting and it will be made available um, to you so you can share with colleagues or if you wanna go back and review, um, it will be available for you. Uh, and we'll be sending that out in a follow-up email uh, following this uh, informational session. Uh, my name is Beth Lambert. I am the Director of Innovative Teaching and Learning and also the Acting Chief Innovation Officer here at the Maine Department of Education. And I'm very excited uh, to be hosting this information session and uh, being, uh, being able to partner and work with the folks at BAR that are joining us today and learn more and more about this program and make it available to your, your schools. Um, the commissioner, as well as all of us here at the department, are so excited about the opportunity to provide something on a statewide scale to all um, willing and qualified uh, schools who would like to go on this adventure with us, make this commitment. Um, BAR is a really wonderful program that, uh, while it will be implemented and available statewide, really is customizable and will meet you where you are in your school uh, at this time. And so that really appealed to us at the department as something that was this large scale. It's not a one size fits all. It's not based on um, research that happened in you know large urban areas outside in another state that doesn't look anything like Maine and we try to implement it here. Um, what you'll learn about today is a lot of uh, the studies, research, um, and experiences of folks right here in Maine uh, that's been done and how different each one is, uh, but what's similar is the results and their consistent and amazing results um, through, as I say, meeting schools where they are and really um, it not just focusing on just academic outcomes or just SEL outcomes or discipline, but rather how do we look and focus on the whole student, which of course is a is a priority here at the department. So I won't say any more, but I'm gonna hand it over to um, Rob Metz, who is the deputy director of BAR and the BAR Center, excuse me. And Rob was also the principal at the first BAR school. So take it away, Rob. Thank you, Beth, much appreciated. Um, as, as the slides are pulling up, I'll just say again, my name is Rob Metz, Deputy Director of the Bar Center. I'm super excited to be here with you this afternoon. We have four special guests that are going to be uh, speaking in just a minute. Jennifer Mull Brooks from Cogden Elementary, Greg Henderson from Mount Blue High School, Shelly LaJoy from Noble High School, and Josh Tripp from Bucksport High School. So I'll start out with a few slides, then we'll transition to hear from the school leaders in Maine, and then we'll leave time for your questions. So as we're moving along, please jot down your questions and we'll get them at the end. First of all, BAR stands for Building Assets Reducing Risks. It is a strength-based K-12 school system that provides schools with a comprehensive approach to meeting the academic, social, and emotional needs of all students through the power of data and relationships, both inside and outside the classroom. I just wanna make a, uh, a couple notes on this page, a couple highlights. First of all, BAR is a school success system. Try not to think of BAR as one more thing that you're going to ask the folks in your school to do. BAR is different, it is a system. Um, many people have used the analogy of a coffee cup. Schools have lots of initiatives that they're already implementing but they're all implemented in silos and somewhat uh, separate from one another. And they describe BAR as the cup that holds all the things they're already doing and helps them to be more effective. So when you take on BAR, you don't have to change any of the things you're already doing. They're going to work better because they're being held in the BAR system. Other people describe it as the glue that holds their school together. So it's very important that you think of BAR as a school success system. And that's another reason that it's, it really uh, works anywhere. Small schools, big schools, any kind of school, when this system gets put in place, the results uh, are very predictable. Secondly, as Beth said, it combines both the social uh, and the academic world. 
And you're going to see examples of that as we move along. Our motto is same students, same teachers, better results. Next slide, please. Bar is built on two key pillars. The first is relationships, and the second is data. I describe Bar as a relationship building machine. It's a way to turn your school into a relationship building machine. We focus on three different types of relationships, staff to staff, which are very important because we're gonna be asking teams of teachers to meet and create strategies for students. Student to student relationships, also very important. In, in, in many cases, uh, especially in secondary level, students can become very separated from each other. They might be involved in different activities. They might form cliques of some type. Bar is going to intervene in all of that and the students are gonna to get to know each other better than ever before. And of course, staff to student relationships, very important. We don't take any of these for granted. This system is gonna create these relationships. Data, two different kinds of data, quantitative and qualitative. Uh, quantitative data, of course, we're gonna be tracking grades, attendance, discipline, but qualitative data is equally important. And I'm gonna highlight a couple of these photos here on this picture or on this slide. On the top left, you see some elementary students who are involved in what we call a U-time activity. These are the social emotional lessons that, uh, that are part of the bar system. On the bottom left, you see secondary students. These I-times and U-times are relationship building activities that the teacher participates alongside the students. That's where these relationships are built. It's also where lots of uh, data is collected. All the qualitative data that's collected during an I time and a U time is then brought to the teacher team meetings. The, the two pictures on the right hand side show examples of that. On the bottom side is what we call a small block, bottom of the right hand side. This is a small group of teachers who are meeting, creating strategies for students. They're collecting data on a spreadsheet that you see in front of them. The upper right hand corner is what we call a big block meeting. Again, a group of teachers leading to create strategies for students. When they meet on that spreadsheet, they have all the, the quantitative data, the grades, attendance, discipline. They also have a tremendous amount of qualitative data that they've gathered. What is the student interested in? What are they good at? Who's got the best connection to them at this school? When folks say we should be using a whole child approach, that is exactly what this is. All of this information is being gathered and then these teams of teachers are creating strategies based upon that information. Next slide, please. There are eight key components to BAR. You'll hear about these as our school leaders are speaking. Focus on the whole child, which I just described. There's professional development for teachers. We do two days of training uh, before each year that BAR is implemented. And by the way, it's a three-year implementation process. So we come to the school and do two days of training before the first year, the second year, and the third year. There is the social emotional curriculum that I highlighted. At the secondary level, it's called I time. At the elementary level, it's called U time. Students are, are put into cohorts and assigned a, uh, a team of teachers who really watches out over that cohort. We'll describe that more later. They don't have to be perfectly matched, but they do have to be cohorted in some fashion and the teachers do have to form teams. There's a lot of flexibility. We'll get into the details in a bit. Um, there's a community connect process that engages uh, students, families with the community. Uh, families love BAR uh, because if you can imagine that picture on the previous slide, all those adults around the table, all focused on their child, all sharing information together about their child in a strength-based way. What could be a better feeling for a parent? And then administrators are engaged in a different way. Um, you'll see in some of our data that administrators in bar schools um, get a great benefit from being part of this process. Next slide, please. Bar has done a tremendous amount of research. Um, a very quick version of the story is uh, many years ago, Angela Jarabek, who's our executive director of the Bar Center, 
was a ninth grade counselor at the first bar school. And she saw the amazing outcomes that were happening at that school and decided to apply for a federal grant. Um, this was during the Obama administration. It was called I-3, which stands for Investment in Innovation. It was really a contest for innovation. innovation. She applied and was funded, and two schools outside of the original school were able to do bar. One was a large school in California, and the second was Bucksport High School in Maine. The school in California was big enough where they did a randomized control trial. So half the students did bar, half didn't. And after one year, the students on the bar side did better in every way. They passed more classes, they got in trouble less, they attended school more. And so she applied for the second level of funding, which was called a validation grant. She received that funding and we did 11 more randomized control trials, all corners of the country, including Maine, and that grant also provided funding for other schools to get bar started in their school. Some of those schools were in Maine. Based upon the outcomes of that research, which were the same as the initial research, she applied for the scale-up grant. This is like the grand prize of this competition. We did 66 more uh, randomized control studies. This time they were school to school. So think of two like schools, uh, one school got bar, one didn't. And after one year, the outcomes were compared. And again, the same amazing outcomes. These 20 outcomes that you see on this uh, slide are repeatable through all three of those studies. They're very, very predictable. They happen again and again and again. And because in the last study, we were able to randomize by school, we now have teacher impacts that we can, that we can look at. So many of these outcomes are student outcomes, many are teacher outcomes. Along the bottom, you can see that along the way through this research journey, we've been accredited and validated by all kinds of outside organizations. Some are more uh, academic in nature. Like for example, we're in evidence for ESSA five times in reading and math. And some are more social emotional in nature, which is pretty amazing. Next slide, please. This is a chart that our evaluators from the American Institutes for Research put together. They were trying to figure out what is happening. How are these schools getting these amazing results in one school year? They had tremendous amount of data and they crunched that data and they created this mediation analysis to tell that story. So along the bottom are the 20 statistically significant outcomes that you saw in the previous slide. And what AIR said is that this process actually happens in order. It starts on the left and goes to the right. So teachers perceive their school administrators as more effective. They believe they can make a difference. They're, they learn how to collaborate with each other in a different way and to use data in a different way and to build positive intentional relationships with their students. When that happens, the students feel it. They feel more supported. They feel more excited and engaged and engaged students attend school more, get in trouble less, do better academically. And then the academic outcomes are almost a byproduct of this left to right system. So it was very common for the research schools to say, I don't get it. Our math scores went up and our reading scores went up and we didn't change anything in reading and math. How can that happen? And it's because my simple analogy is, Bar turns your school into a left to right school, a left handed school instead of a right handed school. Before I knew about bar, if I wanted our math scores to go up, I would change the math curriculum. That would have been a right handed answer. Bar does it just the opposite. It turns your school into a left handed school, and the improvement happens in a left to right process. Next slide, please. I'll do this very quickly, but this is just another diagram to tell you how BAR functions. So in the middle are the students. When you decide to do BAR, you can, you can include as many students or as few students as you want. If you're at an elementary school, you can start BAR in one grade level, let's say fifth grade. Or you could start it in your intermediate grades, three through five. If you're at a middle school, you could start in one grade or do the whole school, same at a high school. But whoever you determine is going to do bar 
they're at the center of this diagram. And those students are going to participate in those I time or U time social and emotional lessons on a weekly basis. Then the teacher teams meet and the teams meet to discuss the students that are part of BAR. And they're going to use that spreadsheet you saw in that picture uh, to track all the quantitative and qualitative data and to create strategies for those students. Some of those students are going to need community support. And so there's a third group that meets called Community Connect. And their role is to connect the families and the students who need it to the resources in the community that are available. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a verbal way of describing, a written way, I should say, of describing what was on that chart. So BAR uses a curriculum called I time at the secondary, U time at the elementary to build relationships and gather qualitative data. That information gets discussed in the teacher team meetings. Small block is where the, co the core content teachers meet. In an elementary, it might be the fifth grade teachers. In a secondary, it might be an English, science, social studies, and math teacher that form a, a block. They're going to share a group of students, and they're going to track the progress of those students on the spreadsheet you saw in the picture. The big block meeting is that same small block, except they're joined by counselor, social worker, administrator, whoever you feel is appropriate. On those meetings, you're talking about students that are a little more complicated. They need a little more support. And then finally, Community Connect. That's a third and separate group of adults at the school who are going to be connecting students and families to community resources. This is a very strength-based process. There are, there are excellent meeting protocols that we will teach you to use in these meetings to make them very efficient uh, and very effective. But the key thing is it's, it's very strength-based. We never talk about a student without talking about what is their strength? What is their spark? How are they connected to school? And then we can look at the area we want to improve. And this is transparent. You can imagine all those people around the table talking about a student, all sharing information and data with each other. Everybody's included, everybody knows everything. Next slide, please. Now, if you're considering implementing BAR, there are some things you should know. Uh, first of all, you need to assign someone at your school that our coach can coach. We call that a BAR coordinator. If you're implementing in a small part of your school, for example, one grade level, that can be a, a pretty small role. We just want them to be able to attend the small block meeting, the big block meeting, observe some I times or U times, attend Community Connect. So it can be just added on to a, to a person's role that you already have at your school. If you're considering adding it school-wide, then it's a significant role. It could be a half-time or a full-time position, depending on how big your school is. You have to accept our bar coaching. Our bar coach is going to be connected at the hip with your bar coordinator. They're going to be doing weekly calls. They're going to come to your school 10 times during the three years that you're implementing bar. You're going to be part of PLCs from others that include other schools around the country. Um, so that coordinator needs to be ready to accept the coaching of our coach. You need to be able to create bar teams. We can help you do that. And again, we're very flexible. So if you start in a small part of your school, you may only have one bar team the first year. Um, if you start school wide, you'll have multiple bar teams in your school. Either way works for us. And I can tell you in almost every case, a school that starts with one bar team, the next year they add more. You obviously need to do the I times and the U times for the students that are part of the bar classrooms. And you need to provide time for teachers to meet. Now, in the perfect world, the small block would meet every week and the big block would meet every week, although we are realistic and we know that can't always happen. And so some of our schools alternate small block one week, big block the next week. You'll hear some of that when our uh, school leaders speak in just a minute. The important thing is we will meet you where you're at. We will help you implement uh, whatever way works best for you. Our coach will get to learn you and your school and your culture. And at one school, you may start by implementing I times first. 
At another school, you may start with Community Connect first. At a third school, you may start with everything the first day of school. Either way it works for us, we're gonna help it work for you. Next slide, please. You'll be assigned a bar coach. Uh, we have bar coaches that live in all corners of the country. As I said, there's professional development two days before the, the first day of school in the perfect world, uh, both the first year, the second year, and the third year. You're gonna be part of some virtual PLCs that happen monthly. The bar coordinators from around the country gather monthly, as do the bar administrators. And you'll get all the materials, of course, bo both in hard copy and electronic. Next slide, please. Maine has a long history with BAR. All of these schools have had some connection to BAR. Some of them might be implementing now in either their first year, second year, or third year. Some of them might have been part of that research years ago. Um, some of them may have been trained eight, nine, 10 years ago, but haven't since. And they, they're now they're interested in being retrained through this great opportunity through the Department of Education. Every story is different, but you should know that Maine uh, has a long history with BAR and a long history of success with BAR. Next slide, please. Now we're gonna switch to our experts uh, and we'll start with Greg Henderson. And Greg, uh, when we visited earlier, you mentioned when BAR came to your school, you were a bit of a skeptic. And I'd love for you to share that story of how skeptical you were and how that's turned around for you. Thanks, Rob. Um, so yeah, I'm a skeptic. It's just who I am as a, as a person. And obviously that flows into my professional work as well. Um, but for me, my connection to BAR started, I was working at a different school, not Mount Blue where I am right now. Uh, and I had a, a teacher come to me to say, Greg, do you know that 50% of our ninth grade kids are failing their math class? And I, of course, said, no, I haven't. I did not know that. I had no idea. Uh, and she said, well, we should do something. And I said, yes, I agree. Please do it. Let's figure it out. Uh, so anyway, this led to a conversation about how do we better support our ninth grade kids and a little committee that came together and through their work um, gained some awareness of this program called BAR. Um, and um, so we said, this seems lovely. Everybody's so nice to work with. We had an opportunity to, to implement the program, but we were not involved in one of the research um, studies. Uh, and so we put the program in place and we did our best. Uh, and um, at the end of the year, uh, you know, after one year of implementation and not everything working perfectly, it was, you know, it was imperfect. Um, but after one year of putting this program in place, you know, we started with a failure rate for our ninth grade kids, uh, more than 40%. I believe it was 42%. And at the spring, when spring rolled around after that one year of implementation, we had knocked it down to 20%. Um, and I remember, you know, doing a, a staff meeting and sharing with our school that we had in one year fundamentally changed the high school experience for our ninth grade kids. Uh, and it was remarkable. Uh, and that's when I said, okay, uh, you know, I'm, I'm somebody who says, show me that this works. And Barr showed me that it works. Uh, and so that's when I said, okay, we got to keep doing this. Um, and that's really kind of defined a lot of my own career um, experiences um, was connected to Barr and moving forward and how to best work with schools and kids. And Greg, tell us about the teacher teams. You know, in bar schools, teachers work in teams, and they may not be used to doing that in the way that bar has them do that. How have you seen this impact the adults in your school? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I found in my experience working with high school teachers that they are starved for interaction with their colleagues, um, and they want to work in teams. And um, bar provides that um, structure that allows them to do that. Uh, that I think there's a lot of untapped um, uh, possibility there. Uh, and when you put teachers together in teams and say, we're gonna work to support this group of kids that you really do get positive results. So, I mean, I hear from teachers all the time that aside from kids doing better and being more engaged, the thing that they most love about BAR is every week working with their colleagues and having time built into their, their schedules to make it happen. Yeah, and they're and the time they're spending with their colleagues is making a difference, and that that feeds their heart and soul, right? Yes, for sure. 
Uh, Jennifer, I'm going to switch to you. You are unique on this panel because you are an elementary principal. And I would love to, to have a conversation with you about that. So previously you worked at a high school, as I understand, connected to bar. And when you went to the elementary, you brought bar with it, with you. What was it that made, convinced you uh, to bring bar to your elementary school? Um, I, I was um, lucky enough to work in the same school district um, at Westbrook High School and um, moved down as an assistant principal there where we used bar. And um, I was able to see how it fostered um, such positive relationships between staff and students, students to students um, and staff to staff through the freshman team meetings um, and watched the, um, you know, I was at the meetings and I was, you know, the assistant principal. So, you know, managing a lot of um, behaviors and a lot of frustrated teachers and just watching that change through um, the use of um, I times at the high school level, and then our our, our block meetings, um, talking about students and knowing the students, so that relationship piece and the positive impact it had on the educational experience for our students at the high school. When I came to the elementary level, um, I knew it could work here. It's the same community, um, same you know demographic as we had at the high school, and I just knew that. Um, you know, kind of restructuring our our PLC time and um, common planning time to frame the dialogue um, in a more positive way. In a, you know, looking at students' assets and you know not their struggles. Um, like you said, speaking positively about students um, really changes the way people frame um, their view of students and. Um, so that was, I saw a need here for that um, and um, I decided that I wanted to bring it here and was lucky enough to have a superintendent who for the couple of years that I was begging, he finally <laughs> gave me the go ahead um, and um, we're now in um, year two. And tell me how you found a creative way for your teachers to have the time to meet. How do you set up your meeting schedule? Yeah, that was a real struggle at the elementary level. Um, if anybody has ever transitioned from high school to elementary, the scheduling process is so different. The elementary schedule is a twisted matrix of um, misery, I call it, because it's so hard to find that common planning time. So we started out using our Wednesday early dismissal PLC time. Um, so we were kind of stealing curriculum time a little bit um, to, to implement BAR and then realized we couldn't do it all effectively in that little time frame. I did it after school for a little while that like we have a faculty meeting a month and then an additional meeting every month. Um, at the end of the day, I found teachers were a little bit spent and um, and that extra meeting just felt like an, an, the extra thing that you talk about. And so then we looked at common planning time and it worked that we had every Thursday, every grade level has a common planning time so we um, moved it to the common planning timing and went back to our regular PLCs. Um, so we have a weekly um, small block for every grade level um, and our, our bar coordinator attends those. And then every other week we're able to do the big block. And then um, we carved out um, Friday mornings, every Friday we have our community connect. So that was the most challenging part of the, the implementation I would say, um, but now we are a well-oiled machine. And I will just reassure people on this call, we are actively coaching at the Bar Center uh, as of now, about 150 schools in all corners of the country, each with a different unique schedule. And we're always able to help you navigate and find a way that works for you. So we have a lot of experience with this and we can help you do that. I have one more question for you, which involves the coordinator. So the coordinator's role is important. That's the person that we coach. Um, Tell, tell me about some characteristics you were looking for uh, at your school for a good coordinator. Um, I was, um, I, I jokingly um, refer to her as um, our buddy, the elf of our school. She is a friend to all and has a ton of institutional credibility, um, highly organized, highly driven, student-centered. Um, and, and because of her, that, that, institutional credibility and respect. Um, staff here respect her a lot. She's an excellent teacher, moved into the um, bar coordinator and intervention strategist position. Um, so when she attends those small block meetings, um, she 
has an agenda. Um, she has a reflection time on our U times, checks in with everyone how that went, collects qualitative data, um, and then takes, you know, has conversations about students that may be needing to go to Big Block or Community Connect. So um, she's really the the heart of um, how well we function here. Um, and it's um, her skill set is, um, you know, is unparalleled. Um, we have another co-coordinator who manages um, um, some of our big block meetings and our data collection. So she's a little bit more behind the scenes, um, but our, our the one that attends the meetings has been having her attend every single small block meeting has been a game changer for us in our implementation. Thank you. Uh, Shelly, I'm going to jump to you. You're in a unique situation because your district is implementing BAR at both the middle school and the high school. So tell us what the advantages are of that. How is that working? I am so grateful for our middle school and I'm so grateful that we have implemented it in grades six through nine. Our district is a little different because, or maybe we have a six and seven school, which makes up our middle school. And then our high school is grade eight through nine. Um, and I think the most important thing for our middle school, when students come in at grade six, they're coming in from three rural towns. And so they're coming together as one for the very first time. So in the sixth grade, the teams use utilize the I times right off the bat. Like they really front load quite a few of them because they're teaching students how to connect with one another, how to connect with their teachers, really trying to build that one school community as opposed to being those three separate communities. Um, and they're really trying to foster that connectedness to school. And then the another benefit that I love about them having BAR is that they're able to intervene a lot earlier with interventions for students and really look at student needs, family needs, and put some things in place a lot earlier so that we at the eighth grade and ninth grade level um, can just sort of piggyback off of that. And we're able to, I think they are able to at grade seven and even six to see student progress a little bit sooner because they have so much in place uh, much earlier. And I, that's a huge benefit for us. And thinking back to a comment about, you know, the conversation, our transition data from middle school to high school, like is incredible. Like the information that we get is we get a students, we get their strengths, their sparks, we talk about what their struggles are this year, and then we learn from the middle school what kinds of interventions have they done, what has been successful, what hasn't been successful, and we're able to start our year with this rich, incredible data to sort of start working with our kids, so that's like a blessing, and I just want to, just a little caveat that I thought about this year, I had a student that was transferring from, from me in eighth grade to Westbrook Middle, and I knew that Westbrook Middle School was also a bar school. And so I feel like that was, I was able to pass on some really good information about my student knowing how they were gonna use that information because um, she was definitely a high risk kid. And that was just this wonderful feeling of community in our state. And I was so excited to um, have that connection with um, Westbrook Middle. So thank you to Westbrook for that. And you reminded me of another important note is that when these teacher teams are meeting, they're creating strategies for students quickly and putting them in place. And if they work, they keep them. And if they don't work, a couple of weeks later, they change the strategy. It's very quick uh, PDSA cycles, you might call it, that are, that are fast. Um, we have a lot of information rolling in that shows that referrals to special ed go down in bar schools because the teachers themselves are creating these interventions quickly, trying them out, uh, getting them in place. Um, so rather than waiting for a student to fail and then referring them or dealing with it that way, the teacher teams are able to, able to be much more proactive. And I'm sure you've seen that too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm gonna switch to Josh real quick. Uh, Josh, you're in Bucksport, which was the first school in Maine out uh, to implement BARS. So you've been doing it a long time. And I know that you were a teacher there uh, when BAR was implemented, now you're the principal. So you have a long history Tell us how it's changed the culture of the adults at your school. Yeah, so I think I try to think back um, to when I was teaching and I just remember when we brought in bar and kind of like Greg was saying, I, I'm a bit of a skeptic too. Like, you know, there was just seems like being a lot of changes coming on, a lot of different programs. And I felt, 
no, we had a really good staff that was working really, really hard. Um, we just weren't moving the needle nearly as much as we wanted to with our students. Um, you know, we had freshman transition teams, we had SAT teams, we were going through the RTI process. And I just felt like we were working really, really hard and not getting the results that we were really looking for. Um, so when Bar came in, um, you know, I think it really just brought in a structure for us to be more efficient and effective with what we were doing within the school. Um, and I think the biggest thing I saw in terms of culture changing is that when you start adding transparency and reliance on one another during these block meetings, you know, that you have to be there to provide the data for your students that you're tracking and you're sharing the interventions that you're using in your classroom. Um, you know, it just, it's less about the content and it's about instructional strategies. It's about how we work with kids. It's about the information about kids and those anecdotal stories. Um, I think we just started seeing everybody that we've taught with for 10 years completely differently, right? So I had been in education while well, I had the same teachers and I was learning so much more about them from these meetings. Um, and again, I think it, that was just really a huge change to our culture um, at Bucksboro High School. And, and we saw immediate results, you know, in our data. Um, so, you know, I think we were hovering right in the mid 70% graduation rate back in 2009 and 2010. Um, and then with a few years, we were at 95% for our graduation rate. And now we, we are consistently in the low 90s. So, um, you know, we saw, you know, huge results. And again, it just I think that feeling, you know, you work really hard as a teacher um, and you put in all that time and effort, but to actually see the benefit to what you're doing, you don't mind putting in that time and effort to all these different um, things if you know it's working. And, and that was, I think, the biggest benefit we saw with BAR is that we were more efficient, um, but more effective. Thank you. And, and what would you say to people who are thinking about implementing BAR, they're not quite sure if they're ready, do you have any advice for schools that are in that situation? Yeah, I've actually been asked that, I, I think, like three or four times in the last couple of days, just knowing that people are trying to make this decision and there's a little bit of a tight turnaround here on, <laughs> on whether they want to jump in or not. And they're like, well, how do I, I think it works. I can see the data and like, you know, how do I convince people that this is what we want to do right now? I think kind of what I was saying before, you're already doing it, just, you know, spread out through your school. And I think this is, just a very, very well packaged way with professional development assistance to streamline what you're already doing. Um, and, you know, I do like the, the flexibility um, that it provides where you can do bits and pieces of it. But, you know, I highly recommend the closer you can come to full implementation and, and operating with fidelity is when you're going to see the results. I mean, it, it's great to take bits and pieces of it and, and try to make sure that, you know, everybody's comfortable. But you really will see the results when you're implementing it, um, you know, as close to fidelity and, and with all the structures in place. Uh, thank you, Josh. I want to make sure we get to the questions. We have about 15 minutes left. I'm going to finish with one story, but if you're working on your questions, you can put them in the chat or get them ready, get ready to hop off Zoom and ask your question. Beth will help facilitate the question and answer time. We have some great experts here to answer your questions. Um, I had the great opportunity last year to interview some of our uh, longest running bar schools. And I, I discovered something that I wanted to share when I interviewed the teachers who were part of the teacher teams that Greg was talking about. Uh, they got really close to one another. And when they saw themselves uh, being effective and students making progress, and they knew that they did it, uh, when I asked them what they liked about bar, they had a very emotional answer. They said, we love our team. Uh, we know we're making a difference. One of them, who's actually from Maine, said, you know, we're saving souls. So that the teachers were getting fed, I call it, through this work with BAR. Uh, they were feeling good about it. When I asked the principals, they would sometimes go to the data. They would say, our graduation rate went up, and our reading scores went up, and our math scores went up, and we have fewer suspensions. And, and those were all true. And they were very excited about it. And when I went to the district office, uh, they said, we like it because we know that school knows what they're doing. They know why they're doing it. They're rowing in the same direction. They're on a mission. They have a direction. So that the district office saw that Bar provided a pathway for success for that school. Um, so I thought that was very interesting that all three levels of the organization had slightly different answers um, and they were all positive. 
So let's transition to the questions. Uh, Beth, can you help us by reading some of the questions and then we'll have our panel uh, answer as many as they can here today. Absolutely. So what is the average school size or student body size where the bar coordinator becomes a half or a full-time position? Oh, does anyone want to try that if you're on the panel? Otherwise, I can give it a try. I can, I can answer that a little bit. Um, we're a school of 300 students. We have um, currently have 20 classrooms, um, two ML classrooms and two special education classrooms. Um, we have our um, intervention strategist as the bar coordinator. It kind of just fits nicely into that position. Um, and I, I would say it takes up about um, a quarter of her schedule, um, maybe 30% of her schedule. So if you are fortunate to have an intervention strategist in your elementary school, that's a logical place to look. Would, uh, would anyone else like to answer that one at the secondary level? Greg? Yes, yeah, I, I can share a little bit. Um, so I'm a school counselor here at Mount Blue and the coordinator for the program. Um, and we've really rearranged a lot of our structures at the high school to be focused around the bar program. And so I'm the school counselor only for ninth grade students. Uh, and so I've, my work uh, as a coordinator and as a school counselor is really dominated by bar. And so I would say probably 100% of what I'm doing is connected to bar in some way. Uh, when I think about the responsibilities of the coordinator, you know, again, probably between 20 and 30 percent of my time is, is specific to coordinator tasks, uh, and I've been able to integrate it into my uh, position as a school counselor. Yeah, great answer. It's no accident that the creator of the bar program was a ninth grade counselor, and that ninth grade counselor role and the coordinator role are a perfect fit because you're really doing the ninth grade counseling job by being the bar coordinator. Great question. Is there another question, Beth? There is. How do you use the workbook volume one for grades six through eight materials at the same time without duplicating? Ah. Shelly, do you want to try that? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, there are actually three volumes of iTimes. And so what we have done is since our ninth grade implemented first, our ninth grade uh, used volume one. And then our grade six, seven, and eight all split I times um, between volumes two and three. So mostly at our sixth and seventh grade, they're using primarily all of volume two, a little bit of volume three, and then at eighth grade, we're using volume three. But what we do each year at the six, seven, and then for me, eighth grade, is we compare because there's a coordinator for that school, six and seven, and then myself for grade eight, and then we have a coordinator for grade nine. Um, for, for myself and the coordinator at the middle school, we kind of compare which ones did you do this year, which ones didn't you get to. And so then that will change what my teachers might do the next year. Uh, we've also sort of created some of our own sort of playing off of some of them, which has been really helpful as well. Um, and so that's pretty much how we manage our I times. It sounds like the bar coordinators need to coordinate with each other on those I times. Yeah. Thank you. It's different, it's different like each year, depending on what's happened and with COVID. And sometimes you can repeat from six to eight because students have forgotten or they didn't remember, or there's something that comes up that's really specific that like we have a bullying situation. So we have a bullying eye time that we're going to do to sort of manage that piece. So there's little pieces like that, that change the order. Thank you. Beth? Yes, this one I think is for me. How long is the DOE supporting new schools for this? What happens after expense wise? So um, the DOE's commitment, we understand the three years of implementing BAR. So the DOE's commitment is those three years. This first year um, we are using federal funds so that it's a, that will be taken care of there. And then um, we will transition to alternate funding for the remaining second and third year. Um, Related to that question, <laughs> is the coaching over the first three years targeted at getting schools to the point of independence and in implementation of BAR? Yeah, that back yes, to you, Rob. Yes, and I can take that one. And the answer is yes. So over this many years of research, uh, we discovered that it really is best to do a three-year implementation. That's where the results were the greatest. And so our whole system is designed to coach and train a school for three years. At the end of the three years, the school can operate on its own. Um, so 
we give them an opportunity if they'd like to stay engaged with us to do so at a much lower cost and a much lighter touch. Um, so that is a possibility. We call that a Thrive membership with BAR. And we do have quite a few schools that choose to do that, to stay connected with us and stay participating on the PLCs. And there are other advantages that come along with the Thrive membership. But in general, uh, three years of coaching and training, you should be self-sufficient. We're proud that there aren't any tails to bar. There's no added cost after those three years unless you choose to do it. We're not adding staff in your school from our team. So when those three years are done, it's our hope that you are independently able to operate uh, the bar system. Great question. Other questions? And you can raise your hand too if you'd rather just ask the question. We're we're open, whatever you'd like. Yes, please. Uh, here comes one in the chat box. Is it possible to get a list of current high schools involved um, to be able to reach out with questions? Yes, uh, Jenny. I know you're on this call. Uh, do you mind answering that one? Sure. Um, so yeah, they're asking. Absolutely, for we can do that. So I think that if I'm if I'm hearing it right, you would like to maybe reach out to another school independent of this to ask some questions. So Beth, I think we it did. Um, Mr. Bowers, did I interpret that correctly? Correct. Yeah, because I, I the big thing running through my head is is scheduling. Since we've already built the schedules, I'm wondering, you know, I might have some particular questions there. I think that that's a very common question, and we can do that. Um, I think uh, with just a couple minutes left, though, because it might be um, a common thing. Could somebody take just a couple minutes to talk about scheduling? And if a person already has a schedule established, and then in the meantime, uh, Mr. Bowers, we'll 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 follow up with yeah. your request. So we will do that for, for sure. Because you'll yeah you'll have specific yeah. questions. Yeah. yeah, a list of schools that are currently implementing that you can reach out to. And by the way, uh, some of these schools are used to people calling. They're used to giving tours. Uh, they're very kind that way. So um, they'd love to talk with you. And we'll get that list. Beth, is it better to provide it to you? Um, either way, we can, as we put together sort of a follow-up email with the video recording and, and resources, that would be fine. Um, and I can blast it out to everyone. Great, that's perfect. Um, anybody on the call here want to just say a couple words about scheduling? Greg or Josh? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, so Mount Blue is about 730-ish students. And so we try to keep our student teams uh, under 100 apiece. And so each one of our student teams has a corresponding English, math, social studies, and science teacher. Uh, and typically what we do is when we... Um, um, when we register our eighth grade kids, our incoming ninth graders, it's kind of depending on what courses they're uh, going to be in, involved in, we uh, tease out which team that they would fall into. Uh, and then when it comes to scheduling, we just make sure that each team is scheduled in advance with uh, one common prep period um, that the small block and big block meetings can take place in um, every week. And so we mirror, mirror schedules over uh, the set of students students. Um, and it, it is more work for sure. Um, but so long as you, you know, set out to do that task, understanding what your end result is going to be, then usually it'll, it'll be okay. And obviously having somebody at your school that is great at scheduling makes a big difference. And I can tell you that over years, the first year a high school especially creates a bar schedule, um, halfway through the year, they're like, okay, I know I'm not going to do that next year. I have a better way. And it takes a couple of years to kind of refine it and get the bugs worked out at your school, depending on the number of class periods and so on. But it, it's very doable and uh, may not be perfect the first year, but it'll keep getting better and better. Next question, Beth. Yes, it sounds like it fits well in an advisory block. Is once or twice a week sufficient for meeting with students at the middle and high school levels to effectively implement BAR? Um, I'm going to put a, a little caution on that one or a, a little caveat. So the, the I times uh, and the U times, which I think this question is referring to, 
Um, it's really important, if at all possible, that they're done with the actual content teacher, the classroom teacher. The person that's putting the grade on the report card should be facilitating the eye time because that's where the relationship gets built. That's where you need the relationship and engagement to be built. So I've seen advisory uh, uh, processes where students were meeting in advisory with not one of their core teachers, but a different person. And I would caution against that. Um, also, if at all possible, a weekly eye time is definitely beneficial. Now, having said that, we don't all live in the perfect world. And sometimes that's not possible. And we make do with what we have because we're all teachers and we're used to that. But it's definitely beneficial to do it uh, on a weekly basis. Would anyone else on the panel like to add to that before we go to the next question? Yeah, I, can, I mean, just speaking as the former teacher that really did not want to be the person that was going to teach I times, I was the, <laughs> the cranky math teacher that didn't want to give up content time to do this and felt very uncomfortable. Um, when you have students start coming up to you and like, and we did a rotation, which I think is really important. So one week, you know, the math teacher will do it. Then the next week, the science teacher. So you're only really giving up one set of classes, you know, once a month, basically. So you get one day, once a month that you're doing these I times. So it's, you're not losing a ton of instructional time. And students start coming up to me like, you know, Mr. Tripp, it's, it's your turn to do an I time this week. And the fact that they were kind of catching on to it and, and you know, knowing who was going to do it and, and asking what, what the activity is going to be, you know, I started to realize, like, I need to stop thinking, what am I losing for instructional time and realize that they are are taking this seriously and that there's more to gain from that. So I do think that's really important what you said, Rob. And Jennifer, at the elementary, are your teachers fitting it into their morning meeting or how are they doing their U times? Um, we we just ask that they do, um, generally speaking, we do them on Tuesdays. Everybody does the same um, U time with the exception of kindergarten, depending on if it's um, at their skill level yet. Um, sometimes they pick their, their own um, that's just more age appropriate. Um, so um, we, we all do it on the same day, have the conversations at small block on Thursdays. We generally, we do them Tuesdays, have small blocks on Thursdays. And what we have found here, um, doing them all, all the same U time in the same week has created um, the artifacts that come out of that. Um, you know, like what our, my favorite is the rainbow in someone else's cloud where the you saw that in the picture, one of the pictures with the, the children um, doing the, the U time. We have post-it rainbows all over the building, ended up painting rainbow um, wings on one of our walls. And we take pictures of the kids with their rainbow wings and bought a rainbow buddy bench um, for the playground. So it creates this sense of community on top of building the relationships with students within the classroom. So um, at this level, you can really turn it into um, a community building resource too. A great, great example. Beth, I think we have time for a couple more. All right, uh, another question about funding. Does the funding support a coordinator role at all or is it strictly to support the connection with BAR? So the funding does cover all of the expenses associated with, um, with the BAR uh, connection. Um, it, it will not, we cannot pay for a position for you to have a bar coordinator. So that's for the school to sort of figure that piece out. There is funding available for stipends um, to support um, teacher time and possibly um, could be if the coordinator role was in a, it was in like a stipend role in addition to a, a position. Um, but we're still working out all of the details about how those stipends, the, the restrictions and the, the eligible, uh, the use for those stipends. Thank you. I'm seeing we're at time. If there's one more question, I'm sure we could squeeze it in. Or Beth, do you want to wrap this up today? Yeah, if, if, if I don't see any more questions in the chat, um, and if somebody wants to quick put their hand up, we'll call on them. Otherwise, um, we just want to thank you so much uh, for your interest and uh, participation today. I hope this helped to give a, a clearer picture, um, answer some of your questions, um, and share some of our excitement and enthusiasm about the opportunity that's provided. Uh, you can always reach out to me. Um, with questions about the program, both for funding or um, how the, the program implementation will work. Um, I can connect you with the bar folks or other teachers um, like Josh, Greg, 
uh, Shelly and Jen that are on the call today and others um, that might be helpful. We will have a follow-up email just to give you some additional resources and a link to this video. Um, but thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you are doing every day. Uh, regardless of whether you participate in BAR, we hope that you will, but either way, thank you for your time here today and for everything that you're doing every day with our students. Um, and I hope that you all have a great rest of the night.